All right, so get ready, because today we are diving headfirst into a country that is like always on everyone's travel bucket list, Japan. But here's the thing. What if, like me, you don't speak a single word of Japanese? Can you even, you know, really experience Japan without knowing the language? That's the question, isn't it? And it's what makes this deep dive so interesting, honestly. Mm. We're cracking open this guide, Japan Without Japanese. So cool, by the way. And we're going to find all those like golden nuggets, you know, to help you navigate Japan like a pro, even if you're like starting from scratch with the language. Okay. I'm going to be honest. I used to be totally intimidated by the thought of just navigating like daily life in Japan. I pictured mm. myself completely lost in translation, like trying to order food or something yeah. and ending up with like a plate of squid tentacles when I wanted a bowl of ramen, you know? Oh, totally. It's a common fear. But what's amazing about Japan and what this guy just nails is that even though it's known for being, well, linguistically challenging, it's actually really open to foreign travelers, mm. like surprisingly so. So you're saying it's not just about the language itself, but it's about like how things are set up there. Yes, exactly. Mm. Think about their public transportation, Japan's rail system, particularly the Shinkansen. I mean, those oh, bullet wow. trains are iconic, right? Known for being so efficient. It's crazy. Oh, yeah, for sure. But wouldn't I still need to like understand the announcements and buy tickets and all that in Japanese? Here's the thing. A lot of people don't realize how user-friendly it actually is, even for people who don't speak Japanese. So it's not just about a smooth ride. You're talking about a smooth experience from like the second you get to the station. Absolutely. The clear English signage, mm. multilingual announcements, especially on those Shinkansen lines, and get this, trains every few minutes. Wait, really? Like how often are we talking? Like every three to five minutes, seriously. Right. You wouldn't even have time to finish a cup of coffee before another one arrived. That's wild. Okay, talk about efficiency. That's amazing. But even with all that, wouldn't I still have to like navigate the ticket system, mm. deal with delays, find my stop in Japanese? That's where pre-planning comes in. This is something the guide stresses, and I totally agree. Booking your tickets in advance just eliminates so many of those on-the-spot conversations that can feel stressful when there's a language barrier. Right, right. Less pressure on my, uh, let's call it interpretive dance skills when it comes to communication. Exactly. And while we're talking about making things smoother, we got to talk about the Suka card. Have you heard about this? I feel like I've heard of it, but I kind of just assumed it was just another transit card like the ones we have here. It is but it's so much more. Think of it as like your magic key to unlock all of Japanese transportation. It works on most trains and buses and sometimes even taxis. Plus, get this, you can use it to buy things at convenience stores. No way, seriously. So I could get off a plane and like be cruising around buying snacks like I live there. Yeah. You can even order it online and have it delivered to your hotel or pick it up at the airport when you arrive. Okay, you're speaking my language now. That's next level, I love it. Right. It's these little things that can make such a big difference when you're in a new place. And speaking of trains, those stations can be huge. Like the guide mentions getting a little turned around in Tokyo Station. Oh, I bet. I've seen pictures. They're like their own small city down there. Totally. And he actually said he found this amazing little ramen shop just by kind of wandering around lost. He never would have found it otherwise. They... Getting a little lost isn't always a bad thing. Exactly. It's all part of the adventure, right? Yeah. And this guide, instead of making you worry about it, actually gives you really practical tips for finding your way again if you do get a little turned around. The important thing, he says, is to stay calm and remember all those resources we talked about, the signs in English, the information desks, even your Suica card can help you retrace your steps if you need to. Like a safety net for when you're, you know, venturing out. So we've covered trains, but what about buses? Are those going to be as easy to navigate or am I going to have to, like, actually learn some Japanese? Yeah, such a good question. And it brings us to this whole other layer of getting around Japan without speaking the language. While mm -hmm. trains are great, buses give you this whole other perspective, mm -hmm. more local, you know. And they have their own system for making it easy, even if you don't speak Japanese. Okay, buses, local experiences, I'm intrigued. But I'll admit, the thought of navigating a bus system in a foreign language makes me a little nervous. How do you even begin to figure out the routes, the stops, the fares, especially if those digital displays are all in Japanese. That's where Japan, without Japanese, really shines. It decodes those seemingly complex systems and reveals just how traveler-friendly they really are. Let's talk about the buses, for example. 
They might not have as much English signage as the trains, but they operate on this brilliantly simple numbered ticket system. Numbered tickets. I'm all ears. Tell me more. So imagine this. You hop on the bus and grab a small numbered ticket from a dispenser near the door. That number corresponds to the bus stop where you boarded. Now, as the bus travels along its route, you'll notice a digital display at the front that shows the fares for each upcoming stop. When your stop number lights up on the screen, you simply check the corresponding fare, gather your things, and pay the driver as you exit. Easy peasy. Hold on, it's that simple. Just match the number, pay the fare, and I'm good to go. No need to decipher Japanese announcements or try to explain my destination. You've got it. It's such an elegant system because it eliminates any language barriers. And the guide emphasizes that just knowing your stop number, or even having a rough idea of the fare amount, is often enough to ensure a smooth ride. Plus, it's a great way to feel like you're blending in with the locals. I love that. And honestly, anything that makes me feel less like a deer in the headlights on public transportation is a win in my book. Speaking of feeling a little lost in translation, the guide mentioned something called limousine buses. Now, are we talking about those super stretched out limos with the disco balls and champagne flutes? Because that sounds a little too fancy for my backpacker budget. I know, right? It's a bit of a misnomer. Don't worry, you won't be pulling up to your hospital in a stretch hummer. Hummer. Limousine buses in Japan are more like comfortable coach buses, often used for longer distances or airport transfers. Think of them as an elevated bus experience, spacious seats, air conditioning, maybe even a little onboard entertainment. Okay, so not quite a limousine in the traditional sense, but still a comfy ride, especially after a long flight. That actually reminds me, what about taxis? Are those a good option for getting around or is that where the language barrier really becomes an issue? Taxis are definitely convenient especially for those times when you're in a hurry or need to reach a specific address. But the guide is spot on in saying that taxis can be tricky when it comes to communication. While hailing a cab is usually easy enough, conveying your destination accurately can be a challenge if you don't speak Japanese and the driver doesn't speak your language. So what's the solution? Am I supposed to become fluent in Japanese just to hail a cab? No need for language immersion just yet. The guy offers a really practical tip, having your destination written down in Japanese, preferably with a small map or a screenshot from Google Maps. This way, even if you can't verbally communicate the address, you have a visual aid to show the driver. It's also a good idea to have the name of your hotel or accommodation written down in Japanese, just in case. That's a great tip. It's amazing how those little preparations can make such a difference. It also reminds me of something else the guide mentioned, tourist information offices. I know, I know it sounds obvious, but are those really as helpful as they claim to be? Honestly, tourist information offices in Japan are like hidden gems in themselves. They're not just there for maps and brochures. They're often staffed with incredibly knowledgeable and friendly locals who are eager to help you make the most of your trip. And yes, many of them speak English and have materials available in multiple languages. That's reassuring, especially for those moments when you need more than just a quick translation or direction. Speaking of helpful resources, the guide mentions something called Koban. I have to admit, that one had me stumped. What exactly is a Koban? Ah, yes. The Koban. They're these small police boxes that you'll find scattered throughout cities and towns across Japan. Now, before you picture a scene from a crime drama, these are not your typical police stations. Think of them as neighborhood watch outposts, staffed by friendly officers who are there to assist locals and tourists alike. So instead of picturing flashing lights and sirens, I should be picturing helpful advice and directions. Exactly. The guide actually encourages approaching Koban officers if you need help with directions, have a question about the area, or even just want to know where to find the best local ramen shop. They're incredibly approachable and are often a wealth of local knowledge. Wow, that's amazing. I love the idea that even the police force is geared towards assisting tourists. Okay, so we've covered trains, buses, taxis, even police boxes as resources. But what about those moments when you really want to venture off the beaten path, explore those hidden alleyways, discover those tucked away shrines that might not be on the typical tourist map? Is that even possible without speaking the language? That's where things get really interesting and where this guide's insights become even more valuable. Because venturing off the beaten path in Japan isn't just about navigating physical spaces, it's about navigating cultural nuances, embracing those moments of potential miscommunication, and discovering the true heart of Japan that lies beyond words. Okay, so we're talking about those times you just want to dive right in, right? Like off the beaten path where a phrase book might not cut it. 
Can you really navigate those situations, connecting with locals, really getting that authentic Japan experience without speaking much Japanese? It's the big question. And what I love about Japan without Japanese is it doesn't try to pretend it's easy. The guide's point is that sometimes those moments where you might say the wrong thing or totally misunderstand each other, those become your best stories. So, like, lean into the awkwardness a little. Find the humor in it. Totally. In fact, he tells this funny story about trying to order coffee out in the countryside. Didn't know the Japanese word, so he just kept saying, coffee, coffee. But, like, with a really bad Japanese accent. No way. Did it work? He swears it did. And he says that silly interaction, the barista thought it was hilarious. It actually led to them talking more. Yeah. He ended up spending the whole afternoon with new friends exploring the area, all because of that one weird conversation. I love that. Like sometimes that shared laughter just breaks down all the barriers, you know? It's true. And it gets at something important about Japan. Politeness, mm. showing respect. That yeah. goes a really long way. Even if you mess up the words, a genuine smile, a little bow, a heartfelt arigato, Thank you. People really appreciate the effort. Okay, so politeness, check. Willingness to make a fool of myself, check. Anything else I should keep in mind, communication-wise, even without the language? He does talk about body language a bit. We're used to, you know, big expressions, maybe, in the West. But Japan, it's a lot more subtle. Got it, so maybe tone down my usual hand gestures a bit? Exactly. Think smaller movements. Eye contact's important, but too much direct eye contact can be a little intense. It's about finding that balance. Fascinating. Those little things make such a difference. Okay, but even with the best preparation, are there going to be times I just need to ask for help? And if so, who should I approach? Oh, absolutely. He's clear about that. Even though he wrote a whole book on getting by without Japanese, asking for help isn't giving up. He says younger people, shopkeepers, they're more likely to speak some English and generally pretty open to helping out. Good to know. I'll be practicing my sumimasen, excuse me, for those moments. It's funny, you know, he mentions that even with all the tech, he still prefers a good old-fashioned phrase book. Right. I thought that was interesting. I'd be all about the apps. But he, he says there's something about having the physical book, highlighting things, practicing. Plus, no need to worry about battery life or internet access, right? True, true. Any recommendations on a good one? He actually loves the Lonely Planet Japanese phrase book, says it's got all the essential phrases, a section on etiquette even, and is well organized, easy to use. Perfect. Adding that to my list right now. So as we get ready to wrap up our little Japan journey here, what's the one big takeaway you hope our listeners will remember as they plan their own trips? You know, after really digging into this book, the thing that sticks with me is you don't have to be fluent to experience the magic of Japan. It's about being willing to try to embrace the unknown, to engage with the culture in a genuine way. Even if your Japanese is limited to a few words and some enthusiastic gestures, those are the moments, those little connections, those shared laughs, that'll stay with you. Couldn't have said it better myself. It's about the journey, not just the destination, and embracing all the bumps along the way. So to our listeners, remember a little preparation, a little courage, a good sense of humor, and you're going to have an amazing time no matter what. Safe travels, everyone. <laughs>